Welcome to Venture, Observe, and Connect. Um, our guest today is David Burnett. David Burnett is a Sony artisan of imagery. He's also a founder of Contact Press Images. But the thing that amazes me the most about David is his breadth of work. He's covered every important story over the last five decades, at least, um, in news, sports, all the major stories that have shaped our world. So um, I read this quote that I really like, and it was in American Photographer Magazine. And it said, he's been everywhere, but only for an hour. <laughs> I've had to live that down for uh, quite some time, but uh, I live it down one hour at a time, so it actually works okay. I love it. Well, um, today we're excited to hear you tell us your story about covering the fall of the Berlin Wall, which I think took more than an hour. I remember the Berlin Wall and, and the black and white newsreel film and over the first year or two that the wall had been up, that there were these amazing photographs and newsreel pictures of East Germans leaping from buildings and jumping over the, over the barbed wire trying to get into, the, into West Berlin. And it was something you almost couldn't even imagine. It's like, oh, wait a minute, okay, there's West Germany and then over here is East Germany, and inside that is Berlin. And part of that is West Berlin, which is French, British, American. And there's a corridor that goes to West Germany. I mean, you can't even imagine something like that being constructed today. It, it would never have flown. But at the time, it was a big deal. And so this... Um, rock solid presence of the wall dividing East and West Berlin for all of us who grew up in the sixties and into the seventies and eighties. It was, it was a big deal. It was the manifestation of the difference between the Soviet Warsaw bloc and the NATO American uh, bloc. So it had, it wasn't just stone and cement. It, it had a real psychological impact on everybody. So how did you end up going there and covering this story? Well, I had, um, I'd done a lot of stuff in West Germany over the years, but I'd never, let's see, it was 1989 and seven years before that, the only time I had ever been in East Germany was, uh, in 1980, December of 81, I'd been assigned to go uh, to Poland to work on the Time Magazine Man of the Year story, which was the year that Lech Valenza was the Man of the Year. And um, I got to Warsaw. I mean, it took days and days and days to get a visa. And I got to Warsaw. And three days after I arrived, Martial law was declared and solidarity. All the leaders were taken into, uh, uh, you know, were taken away by the cops or the soldiers. And there was martial law in Poland. I happened to beef there for that and shot for four days and then took the night train to East Berlin. And we were all sneaking our film out. I mean, that was the whole thing is like, how do you get your film out? I mean, 1981, it was ab there was nothing, no one had ever heard of a digital camera. And so everything was film and you had all these little cassettes of film. I mean, they were like gold. Once you'd shot a picture that you liked, you didn't ever want to do anything that would risk losing it. And it was always, you know, your right front pocket and your pair of jeans was where the shot roll of film would go. And nobody was allowed to get in there except your right hand. Never, never the left pocket. Well, usually left pocket was uh, un, uh, unexposed. So you were saying that in October of 89, you were starting to hear some rumblings that something might be happening. It just seemed like the, the cracks were starting to appear. I mean, Gorbachev had been the... Um, uh, Soviet premier by then for four years. And it just seemed like there was, you know, perestroika, miri druzhba, peace and friendship. There are all these things that kind of were setting these little cracks 
going into the whole of Eastern Europe, which had been for the previous 40 years, these super hardcore, tough guy uh, governments. And I thought, well, maybe I should go to Germany. So somehow I thought in my little pointy head, I thought, well, if I book a hotel in East Berlin, then at least I'll be in East Berlin and that'll give me a chance to meander. And I was going to go Wednesday night and I would have been there Thursday for the real opening of the wall, except that my old buddy, Douglas Kirkland, this wonderful photographer who just actually passed away at, um, in his mid eighties, uh, about two weeks ago, a great, great photographer, glamor and portrait photographer. But Douglas had a, been invited to do a show up at American university in Washington. And he said, look, I'll do it, but I'm, <coughs> I'll do it, but I'm only going to do it if you're there to kind of hang out with. So I pushed my flight from Wednesday night to Thursday night. And if I hadn't done that, if I had gone Wednesday, I would have been there Thursday. That would have been unbelievable. But I get on the Thursday night flight, and on the and that afternoon, I get a call from Stanley Kane, who was the Time Magazine photo research guy in Washington. And he said, the wall is apparently opening. And I was like, what do you mean? What does that mean? He said, well, the East Germans are no longer issuing visas. They're just letting everybody in. It's like, oh, my God. So I get on the plane. I fly overnight to Frankfurt. And I'm then changing planes to fly to Berlin. And in Frankfurt, I called the, and I, for work, I worked for Time Magazine for 40 years. And this was, at that point, I'd worked for him, you know, 20, 22 years, I guess. And I called Lenny Heinen, who was this tough as nails, German, very, everything had to be by the book. And you couldn't just, you couldn't play games with anything with Lenny. It had to be just right. But she was the photo uh, research editor person at the Bond Bureau of Time Magazine. And I called her from the Frankfurt airport and said, hey, Lenny, I'm on my way to Berlin. Never in a million years could I have imagined that Lenny would just break into tears as she started to tell me, said, oh my God, David, this is so unbelievable. I never thought in my lifetime this would happen. I never thought we would see the wall open up like this. And I think, God, I was very touched by this. It was very moving that somebody who I knew was kind of a hard ass editorial, like you got to do this, you got to do that. She says to me, look, at 12 o'clock today on uh, like uh, Prince William Strasse, right next to Checkpoint Charlie at, at house number 23, there will be a woman in a blue coat holding a red Time Magazine shipping envelope. Give her your film. And I thought, I've just walked into a John le Carre novel of my very own, that I'm going to go to Checkpoint Charlie at noon today and look for a woman who's got a red Time Magazine envelope. Anyway, I get on the plane, fly to Berlin, walk outside, and I hop in a cab. And I said, um, here's the thing, I need to go to Checkpoint Charlie and I need you to kind of hang with me for a little while. And we worked a deal out for, um, I don't know, for a couple of hours. And I got there because I knew I had to ship, it was like 8.30 in the morning and I had to ship film at noon with the the mystery woman with the red Time Magazine envelope. And, um, and then it was all of a sudden, there was Checkpoint Charlie, which was the place that the, American army had kind of set up these, these little, uh, you know, it was a, it was like a corridor walking to a booth where you would talk to somebody and it was kind of hardcore. You can pass or you can't pass. Everything had just been opened up and you were just everywhere you would go, you would see predominantly, uh, well, I mean, it actually was both ways. It was the East Germans who could not believe that all of a sudden they were allowed to go wherever they want. And the West Germans, the West Berliners, who never ever thought that they would see their city as one again. And so you had people just the coming through the gates and 
Um, you know, I, I met the woman at noon. I gave her that first batch of film. And then I went back and shooting. And that night, I somehow, I can't remember where I left my suitcase, my famous 58 pound suitcase. But about eight o'clock in the dark, I had this thing and I'm walking through kind of like a little, um, like a little cartoon character walking through the silent streets of East Berlin, trying to find my hotel, which no longer did it seem like it had been such a great journalistic coup to be on the East side. I probably would have been better off in the West because now you could go back and forth anytime you wanted pretty much. And for the next few days, it was just amazing. But that first night I went down, I followed um, uh, this trail of a bunch of East, German soldiers who were cutting through the wall and and then you and I have a couple of one of you know one of my pictures several of my pictures I just shot I went right to that line of what the wall was and I wanted to just see what the x-ray what the cross section of the Berlin wall looked like and you can just see all the the bricks and the concrete and very good uh German masonry at work here and why it was so sturdy and why it was the wall was not an easy thing to break down. But seeing that, it just, it struck me. And and I went to the Brandenburg Gate, which is this old 1800s, uh, you know, in, in the days when cities all had gates at the edge of town. And it's this big, beautiful marble thing with columns and horses and stuff on top and all lit up. And it was like, Wow, this is pretty, this is pretty amazing. And this is a, you could just tell that the world was having a changing moment. So it was, it was very, very touching and very moving to be there and to see the welcoming that the West Germans would be giving their East German brethren as they came over. I wish I had probably stayed on and done some more work, but I have to say as a photographer, just having that chance to be in Berlin for that week, that was really something. And, you know, I, um, you know, I got a few okay pictures. It was one of those things where I, I think very often we're in situations where the emotional impact of what we're experiencing is more powerful than the photographs we end up coming away with. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes it's like a nothing event and you get an unbelievably great picture. And there is no way ever to balance that out. There's no way to know ahead of time. You just go and play your the cards that you're dealt. And when you get there, you do the best you can. Some days it just takes off and it's like one good picture after the next. And other days you're just kind of wandering around like, what in the heck am I doing here? I mean, yeah, I just I just think about that scene where you arrive there in Berlin at the wall around eight in the morning and you've got to shoot, come up with some good images and hand it off to the mystery lady with the envelope. The first time you see the the wall, I mean, it's this thing that you can't really unless you're super adept or a gymnast. It's like nine feet high you can't just like climb it and people were bringing little ladders and step ladders and trying to climb up and the first the first uh little scene that i saw was just the this whole row of students uh there there was you know once somebody had a little ladder that you could get up there people would be just streaming up the ladder and kind of filling out for hundreds of feet and you see, you see some of my pictures. They're not dramatic pictures, but it's like you've never seen people sitting on the Berlin Wall before. At the time, it was really um, something to to see that that wow, they really are just there. And um, honestly, the best pictures made of those few days were by Alex Avakian and Tony Swow, who happened to be photographing some some young people who were on the the western side and they had a giant pick the kind you would use to dig a sewer hole in the in the in the blacktop on a street and they're like whacking this thing and there's a hole starts to 
emerge and you can kind of see into West Berlin through this hole. And at one point, the East German, uh, I guess the fire brigades shot a fire hose into this hole, which as soon as it hit, it would just break out and spray everybody in water. And the, these guys are all just grimy and got a pick and they're hitting it with a pick. And when I saw those pictures, I thought, man, that's better than anything I've got. So how did that work, say, when you were in Berlin covering the fall? Um, you're, you're competing with all these other photographers, but you're friends with them. Um, can you talk about that? Like about Because it seems like there's incredible camaraderie, but there's also, I'm going to outshoot you. <laughs> I mean, you, you kind of, you know, you you're never going to like take your donkey bag and whack somebody over the head while they're taking a picture. It's not that bad, <laughs> but everybody does kind of acknowledge that we're all here and we're all pals and, and I'm going to get a picture that's better than yours. And, and somehow in your head, you're kind of accepting that, that you're going to be able to come up with something which is going to be just a little better than what everybody else doing and that that's why i say when alex and and tony had those pictures of the water spraying it's like game over and it's like when you're when you're on an, a, a especially a big story like the end of the berlin wall and you know that everybody in the world who's going to get published is there and i'm sure had cartier bresson been well enough he probably would have been there too and that would have freaked everybody out but it's it's there's something, I think, a positive energy. It's like you realize, on the one hand, you kind of realize, well, there's no sloughing off here. There's no just, I'm not going to just walk through it. I'm going to really look for pictures the best I can know how. And sometimes that's good enough, and sometimes it isn't. And sometimes fate will smile on somebody else who's 10 feet away from you, and their picture is going to be the picture. And then every once in a while, if you're in it long enough and lucky enough, maybe your picture will be one of those. The other thing is you can have these conversations with your photographer, colleagues, and friends that you almost can't have with anybody else. We're all speaking a certain language that we know how to say and we know how to interpret what somebody else is saying. But very often, it's like you just try and talk to a, a normal person. We're all in this one big uh, trough of picture possibilities together, trying to figure out how to make something out of it. Right, right. Yeah. And I think we're not only fueled by the adrenaline, but we're also fueled by the camaraderie of being no in that question. situation with these yeah. people who we speak the same language with. Yeah. Any good, um, funny or interesting stories about um, working with the other photographers at that situation in Berlin? Well, there was one time, see now the Berlin Wall is this huge thing. It snaked all over the city, weighed millions of pounds, and everybody wanted to take home a piece of the Berlin Wall. But I get this chunk of Berlin Wall probably weighed 25 pounds, maybe 30 pounds. It's just like pure masonry, you know? And I put it into my donkey bag. And it was the evening the the German Chancellor Helmut Kohl was coming to speak to this big crowd. And so it, there we are, the photographers were all kind of milling around the stage, waiting to see uh, Kohl and his arrival and the VIPs who were coming with him. We're not quite sure who that's going to be. And at one point, I'm not going to carry this bag anymore. I just take my bag and I put it down next to the stairs and I wander around and there's a little bit of a cordon. So you had a little bit of protection and I'm shooting, 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 shooting. And then here he comes, bing, bing, bing. And at some point as the night is going on, somebody says to me, Hey man, is that, is that your bag over there? You just leave your bag there. No. And I would say this normally it's not a good idea. Don't just leave your bag somewhere. But I said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, that's not too smart. Leave your bag there like that. I said, oh, really? Go try and lift it. <laughs> and I went over and was like, oh, my God, what do you got in here? I said, well, I got the whole Berlin Wall in my donkey bag. And uh, he put it on. I said, yeah, nobody's walking off with that bag. I can tell you that. 
So I, you know, Incredible. probably a few rolls of Kodachrome or Velvia in there, and uh, and then a <sighs> god awful like thirty pound chunk of concrete right out of the wall. Okay, where is that chunk of concrete now? You know, uh, it started me thinking when I was starting to think about Berlin the other day. We had a uh, one of those little garden sheds in the back of our house in Arlington, Virginia which that house we sold uh, 13 years ago. My suspicion is that in a corner of that little place, even with a new owner, is this 30-pound chunk of the Berlin Wall. And they're kind of thinking like, man, this guy's weird. What, <laughs> what do you think this is? So, well, you know, you could use it as a – you could build a thing around it and make a great planter, and it would be <laughs> – this little historical thing. But, you know, in so many ways, I think we all try and find beyond our pictures, which really end up being the most telling kind of uh, little chunks of memory that we have. Our pictures, that's really what they do. But the, the physical manifestations of all these pain in the ass trips that we do and places we go, that probably, I have to say for me, was like, the heaviest. And I think I put it in my Samsonite suitcase on the way home. <laughs> and all the baggage handlers are going to be like, man, you're never going to believe how heavy that one is. It was uh, before they really oh. started enforcing that 50 pound limit on baggage. It was like, I love that you brought that home and it's in some unsuspecting person's backyard now. Are there any markings on it or is it, does it just look like a piece of concrete? I think there's one side is kind of gray paint or white paint. And there were a few little, actually, you know, I don't think I have it here, but I had my little uh, passport wallet. I, at one point I had peeled off a little bit of the paint, just the paint, you know, like nothing under it, but a little piece of paint about that big, half an inch around maybe, and put it in my passport wallet so that I would always have that little, Mem you know, one ten trillionth of the Berlin Wall would always be in my passport wallet. But I haven't checked lately, but the next time I get my hands on it, I'm going to look. Given, um, you know, the state of journalism, the state of, um, you know, just where we are with, you know, magazines, newspapers these days, how do you think photographers go out and continue to tell stories that they care about? Well, I think... In the end, uh, the the really the best work you see is going to be done by people who are going to go shoot something, whether or not it's an assignment. I mean, they're gonna they're driven to do something, and and there's still a lot of people who are doing things on speculation, and just because they're emotionally or uh, psychologically whatever drawn to want to tell that story, and. Uh, I just feel bad that we don't have this kind of depth of uh, of money and interest that there used to be to get good photographers out the door and supported. I mean, they should be supported. You shouldn't have to go do everything on your own nickel. And there ought to be good places to see the work published. And there are still a few newspapers that that do a good job, but everybody's under a, a siege from the accounting department. And so the idea of a daily paper is sending one or two photographers to the Olympics, unless you have a couple of hometown people that are going to be in the Olympics, nobody does that anymore. And the, on the other hand, you also have that the wire services and Getty and these sort of big uh, massive organizations that cover everything are going to, are going to pretty much get everything covered, though maybe not in the way that some more slightly offbeat uh, newspaper or magazine photographer might do it. I feel terrible that we've kind of morphed into this world where you have the richness of the internet and being able to see things so quickly. And in, if I want to look up David Douglas Duncan's work, I can see it in two minutes online. But there's, as of yet, there's no real money quotient of that internet world that lets photographers just work for that. I mean, 
what are you going to put it on Instagram and make the kind of money that they used to pay you to do it? I just don't think that it's there. Maybe there's a couple of people doing that, but I don't think. And it's so for me, that's kind of a heartbreak because there's so many more good stories to tell. The ability to find out about things and to prepare what you want to do. You can do so much more and better research online. I mean, that's just a a given the amount of good stuff that's available uh, to find out so quickly. Yeah, I think there's a part of it is, you know, we need to go out there and still do the stories that we're passionate about. And it's just maybe sometimes reverse engineering, like figure out, okay, how can I get this story funded? You know, grants or, you know, pitching it to editors. Well, here's the other thing. I, I remain um, very filled with gratitude to basically every editor that ever gave me an assignment, and particularly the ones at, at Time and at Life who I did a lot of work with, because the main thing is it enabled the work to be done. And whatever else happened to that work afterwards, whether it was in the magazine or I'm going to do a book or uh, let's do an exhibition, None of that could even be thought of if the work hadn't been produced at the beginning. And so you realize that anything that kind of gets a photographer out and looking and shooting and creating, that once that work is created, it can be around yeah. forever, and it should be. And it's the sort of thing to me that that is, you know, you'll never get old, it'll never get old and you'll never get tired of seeing great photography. I just wish there was some better right. way to monetize it all and kind of come up with formulas that would enable more people to be able to work in the ways that they are, uh, you know, comfortable, comfortable with. David, thank you so very much for spending time with us. And I always love your stories and um, just fascinating to hear. It's always a a treat to see you and um, thank you so much for your incredible contribution to photography. Well, thank you. And back at you. I mean, it's just the, th the thing that's so great about this is that we're just people and we happen to have cameras and then boom, somebody will take a great picture and everybody will see it and everybody will notice it. And it isn't even so much an ego thing, but it's just this, the joy of being able to share pictures with the public at large, but even more so with with your uh, your colleagues. I think there's something pretty sweet about that that I really appreciate. I agree. It absolutely feeds my soul doing the work we do. Yeah. All right. Take care. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Thank you so much, David, and we'll be in touch. Okay. Bye.